Thanks so much. Since this is Las Vegas, I feel like David Copperfield. And uh, be from that last question you asked, maybe I start off with some face and eyelid dermatitis from Dupixin, right? 25, year, right? It, it's like I shuffled it in the ether for you. So a, a 25 year old, long standing um, eczema, um, and really quite characteristic atopic dermatitis by history and morphology and distribution. Started on dupilumab um, and noted wonderful response to the body and, and described em treatment emergent head and neck disease, particularly around the eyelids. We employed, uh, I don't send to the ophthalmologist for this. I think this is all skin related. A, a little bit of conjunctivitis is not uncommon. It's gonna be in the mid-teens percentage and some might say it's even higher. It's often related to dry eye, but not exclusively. We don't have a good sense of that. So if you wanna be a little cautious, you could start some wetting drops before even they, they start to, to pilimab and go use those little twisty vials, not the bottles. The bottles are preserved for long use, right? Like you travel, you have that thing in there for two, three years. Little twisties are preservative free. You could use something like Refresh Optive. We use it all the time, a couple of times a day and that can sort of keep that dry eye conjunctivitis at least at bay. So we tried low potency topical steroids, tacrolimus, antifungal agents, because you hear about that sometimes, and she couldn't get any better. And her body was spectacularly improved. But this is a young woman and she's wearing her worst problem on her face. And key question, guys, when this comes up, is your facial or eyelid dermatitis or eye problems worse on the week you give the medicine or work worse on the week you're expecting to give the drug? And this one was by day three or four after the shot, she was flaring up. Very simple solution. We reduced the frequency of the dupilumab and she completely cleared and not at the expense of her body, right? She stayed clear. We were able to thread that needle so why don't we just skip the next dose? Why don't we add three, four days to it? Let's see how that does. If we're still working out, add a couple more days to each regimen, go to three weeks, she's at monthly. So keep in mind this head and neck face dermatitis is a real phenomenon. It is not a showstopper, it is manageable and tends to occur sometime between initiation and your follow-up visit. About 10 weeks to the year out. So you're gonna see it probably at the first or second visit. There's been some good reviews about it. And the real question is, is the face dermatitis a bona fide treatment emergent disease? Is it coming because they're on therapy? Or is it simply that the, that the tide is receding back? The body, the head and neck is in fact getting better because it was always there. And the thing that's stubborn and not getting better is just some residual face dermatitis. So is it worse from the treatment or is it just not better enough from the treatment? And this is all peer reviewed stuff. And what I could gather is, and what we do every single day, literally, is low potency topicals. I like using ointments more than creams because the bases are cleaner. Calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus and pimacrolimus, <coughs> good, good treatments except for the burning and you just acclimate them in. One key tip, I, I know Julie Harper used some desonide in one of her, someone mentioned it. I use desonide ointment, <clears throat> use that for a week straight up, use the next week or two and say, here's your desonide, here's your tacrolimus ointment, which we're worried about burning and stinging. So about day eight, you'll take a little tacrolimus into a lot of desonide and then just keep doing this so at the end of one or two weeks, you've slowly interlaced and you're only on tacrolimus or pimacrolimus and run with it. <coughs> Patch testing is very important. I'm obviously have that bias on there, but a number of these cases are related to allergic contact dermatitis because the dupilumab kind of pushed down the eczema, pushed down some of the other parts of it, but things like nickel and some TH1 driven contact dermatitis can thrive. Uh, Chrysoboral, certainly reasonable and emerging, and topical ruxolitinib I found to be really, really helpful here. Do keep in mind that the topical rux package insert, it, it, it um, suggests not using this drug un 
when patients are on biologics or systemic immunosuppressives. I think this level of surface area is so small that it's not a consequential warning. And why did I lower the dose? Because I knew about Liberty uh, AD solo continue, right? This was, a, this was a dupilumab trial that in the middle of the trial, guys, like at week 16, people got re-randomized to nothing. They just got right off a drug. The same dosage scheme they were on before the 16 weeks, monthly and every other month, just to see what would happen. And it turns out that, in fact, when you, when you lighten the load, you give fewer doses uh, in a month, the, the chances of you holding your EZ75 go down, but they don't go away for everyone. And more than half of the people can maintain their clearance on lower doses. So you run into some side effects, adjust the dose down. God knows it's hard to updose, right? I, we have a number of people on weekly dosing, but that's a fight with the insurance company. No one's coming to your front door when you're saying, why don't you use a little less of that medicine? Just dose a little less frequently. Nobody says if you lower your doxy dose from 50 to 40 or 25 that you're gonna, you know, or 20, you're gonna run into problems. Head and neck, always the big problem. I look, this is heads up. This is um, upatacitinib versus dupilumab. And notice on these complicated graphs, though, for both drugs, head and neck's the hardest to clear. Maybe it's not exclusively a dupilumab issue, but it's, it's a head and neck problem in eight topics. They're complicated on their face. Multiple pathophysiology is going on there. New rash in a total body um, skin exam patient. I've seen this lady for 20 plus years, multiple atypical nevi, just like Julie Harper says, you know, we have our areas of specialty, but we're doing day-to-day -day derm all day long. Uh, melanoma in 2003, in May she calls with a spectacularly itchy eruption. She hasn't called me in 20 years for anything. Bad eruption, really itchy, you know, Epic my chart message looks like eczematous dermatitis. We start desonide up on the head and neck, a fluocinolone on the body. Let's bring tacrolimus in when we're going past a week or two. And she's not getting better. As a matter of fact, she's starting to get a little worse. And these are some of the photos. I hope you could see them. Her whole neck has a patchy dermatitis. And uh, we bring her in and we look, her, her, her axillae are involved but the vaults of her axillae are spared. This is a classic ring around the axilla. So it's not underarm deodorant, right? Because that you spray into the vault. Um, I patch tested her. This was acute eczematous dermatitis that I could not clear over a few weeks. She lit up to Disperse Blue 104, Disperse Blue uh, 106, Disperse Blue 124, and the Disperse Dye Mix, like all of these are nearly blistering. And I said, I, I don't know how blue has turned on you all of a sudden, but this is a, a, a new issue. And of course, what set this off? Her kid goes to Penn State. And she said, she goes, well, my kid goes to Penn State. I'm like, well, what's that supposed to mean? Like, am I supposed to translate that into something useful for me, right? Well, it's a dark, their color's dark blue. So she went to visit um, her child in, in Penn State was cold, bought a Penn State sweatshirt right off the rack, put it on un unwashed, right? And you know, you just bleed that ink right onto your body. And this was a case of dispersed blue allergy from a brand new sweatshirt. Wash your clothes and your sweatshirts before you start wearing them, right? You don't take the underwear out of the package and put it right on. Just general contact dermatitis advice. It's not a personal hygiene preference. It's just wash this stuff out. You know, when you, if you were to hand wash this blue shirt in your sink, you'd have all kinds of blue dye in, in sitting in there. So blue dye, very important. If you like patch testing, and I hope you do, I hope if you're inflammatory dermatoses folks that you get this into your repertoire, and we could always talk more about it. There's something called the textile dye mix, which rolls up a lot of the really important dyes in just one patch test. This is just, I, I, I'll talk about this case. I mean, I could literally go on for an hour on these. This is um, anchoring bias. This is a classic case of anchoring bias. 85-year-old guy sent in for patch testing. You gotta go see Cohen. He's gonna patch test you and figure out what you're allergic to. 
Long history, eight to nine months, but when you dig in, he has a 10-year history, you see on the bottom, of less severe paroxysmally flaring dermatitis. These are snaps of my notes, so you could see what I really write. I'm not verbose. Used oral corticosteroids. Someone did a true test on him and found what looks like irrelevant reactions. Paratertiary butylphenol formaldehyde resin in gold. Um, he, he, very thick soles for four to five years, comes in from a pathologist I know well with spongiotic dermatitis. I'm game. It's a guy with eczema, wants to get patch tested right up my alley. Here's his exam. This is how my whole physical exam looks. Very brief, staccato, tons of data. So this is what he looks like, right? I'm gonna patch test him because I have a spongiotic biopsy and I'm saying, that's just not spongiotic dermatitis. I imagine there's something a little more there. I didn't get much from patch testing with this guy. Um, and, and I buy, I re-biopsied him. It comes back psoriasiform spongiotic dermatitis. And look at the note to add insult to injury. Could be ex an eczematized process or it could be eczematized psoriasis, right? So that's a classic case. Do I have eczema or do I have a psoriasis? Yes, I'm certain of it. You have one of those two, right? And so I, I put him on dupilumab. You hear a lot saying that. The bar to entry is low. The bar of concern is very low. I got an 80, got a 85 year old with AFib and hypertension, right? I want a, something that's gonna be easy to use. Started him on it, absolutely no appreciable improvement. His NRS itch scores are 10 out of 10 and he's still got these thick hands with sharp demarcations at the volar edges. That's not eczema, right? That's probably got a psoriasiform component. But there's some improvement at some parts, so I add acetret, and I am compounding. I am trying to become comfortable with the ambiguity of his diagnosis. There's some eczema, there's some psoriasis, and I don't have to choose him completely. Start him on acetret and th uh, 10 milligrams three times a week, and we're making progress. His body's improving. His hands are getting a little more malleable. I increase to four times a week. Remember, the package insert dose is 10 to 50 milligrams a day. I got the guy on 10 milligrams three, four times a week. Older guy, palms and soles tends to concentrate there. This is him now fully functional, virtually no itching whatsoever, stable for the last two and a half years. Um, I've tried to lower some doses. He flares a little bit. Get some comfort in the ambiguity and don't anchor on a bi one biopsy. And I'll, I'll finish with this last one, Joe. Can I just mention one more thing? Very classic, a 20-year-old, long history of eczema. I have all the necessary diagnostic features in his history for Hannafin criteria for AD. NRS itch score of 10. This is my whole note, the whole note. Um, he goes on dupilumab, and you could see, look, at, this was his um, physical exam. I patch tested him, some relevant things here, biopsy, spongiotic dermatitis. Four months later, he's nearly clear. That's my note, my whole physical exam, nearly clear, right? I don't mention anything else. And then uh, the week right before we came to Las Vegas, surgeon called me and said, I have to do some corrective ear surgery and I'm worried about the dupixent. What do we do, the dupilumab, what do we do about it? And I said, if this is gonna be clean surgery, um, this guy can get really bad when he's off drug. I've seen him when he's in a bad shape. So you have two choices. You continue the surgery as I recommend without a dose interruption, or you could take him off the medicine, feel better, and then you have his staph colonization sore and he's gotten to scratch everywhere. So. Biologic drugs, you'll, you'll, we talk a lot about this at the boot camps, which are really good, very practical things. So I, I got this from Kara's deck, right? Low risk surgery, no change in your psoriasis biologics um, or eczema biologics. High risk surgery, dirty surgery, like they're going into bowel or GU or intertriginous areas. Maybe you say, and this is what happened. Wednesday was the surgery. His dose of dupilumab was Monday before. I said, if you want, he can hold a Monday dose because he'll only be on day 14. And then get through the surgery. If everything goes well, Thursday, Friday, he could restart it. So I'm sort of compromising. If he's getting 
um, sort of dirty surgery, it's usually an emergency. And you don't have time to hold a dose. And if you're given risen kizumab, the dose is every three months. What are you going to do? Hold it and say, come back for your perforated bowel in October and we'll, we'll fix it? No, you run through it and almost every time you're going to be okay. But you could do little tweaks to it and, and, and that satisfies all the stakeholders in, in these uh, circumstances. So I'll stop there um, and uh, next time I'll bring you even uh, more cases, I had a lot of them.